Hello, everyone, and I'm Brian Gross, a longtime uh, committee and staff member of Tuscon and Tucson, Arizona. And uh, we have with us at this segment um, uh, author and screenwriter uh, Melinda Snodgrass uh, from uh, New Mexico. I believe she's, they consider it part of the New Mexico Mafia. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> And so, uh, uh, and she's probably best known, uh, or at least first known to most uh, most people uh, in the uh, in fandom, uh, as uh, working on uh, screen screenwriting for uh, Star Trek uh, Next Generation, and most notably uh, the um, Measure of a Man, uh, which was a uh, quote from uh, Shakespeare's Hamlet. So, uh, without further ado. I will get over to uh, Melinda and let her go ahead and explain about what's going on in her life. <laughs> um, hi, Brian. Well, thanks for having me. Uh, I really appreciate it. And um, for those of you who don't know, Brian and I are also in a role-playing game together, so we've been having a lot of fun with that. Thank God for the technology. Um, you know, like most people, I'm enduring the pandemic. You know, um, it's I, I'm careful about only going out to like go to the market and stuff. Um, and uh, the good news is my horses are back with me in New Mexico. So I spend a lot of time at the barn. Um, I figure I'm reasonably safe there because we have, we're outside and God knows even when we're in the barn, you know, with the wind blowing through it, we're separated by the length of horses. So, you know, we, we feel, and we are wearing masks. Um, you know, it's been very, I should have been, you know, having huge accomplishments on my writing right now. Um, I confess I haven't. I think between the pandemic and election season, um, I felt a little bit distracted. So I'm hoping that I can take a breath <laughs> and get back to really get back to work. Um, and also I've really been focused on getting all of my uh, work, all of my writers, my novels, uh, back available and in print. And, um, you know, it's a slower process than we'd hoped for because, you know, everything has to be put into a new format and then I have to go over the copy edits and then over the galleys. And, you know, I have a wonderful artist doing my cover art though. So that's been exciting. So I, I haven't been totally unproductive in the writing field. It's just, it's been bringing books back um, and making them available again on all the various platforms. So, you know, both um, e and- uh, how, how many of them uh, have you brought back so far in this process? We've got three back so far. Um, we have the first book in my White Fang Law series, uh, which is about a young woman lawyer working in a vampire law firm in New York City. Um, and then we have two of the Imperials books. The first two books of the Imperials saga are up. That's a space opera uh, set about 500 years in the future. And it's sort of, um, there are spaceships and you know military academies, but it's also a real look at societies in crisis and, and uh, you know, second class, you know, being an oppressed second class citizen, uh, what that looks like, what that means. Um, so there's a lot of economics, a lot of politics in it, in addition to some, you know, big mucking. We're getting into the time, the book's coming out, we'll have a lot of big <laughs> space battles in them, but that wasn't my major focus. I used to be a lawyer, so uh, my interest is, you know, in constitutional law and, and politics, and so I like to have that. And, and also economics, which I think gets overlooked a lot in science fiction books, it's, and, and particularly in fantasy books. Like nobody ever explains how anybody's making any money. <laughs> and that really makes me crazy. <laughs> you know? and, and, and much fantasy, uh, everybody wonders like, how do the farmers survive and, and actually bring in crops? <laughs> Because <laughs> there's like armies rolling across them periodically, you know. I mean, I keep asking George um, in his Song of Ice and Fire, I keep going, okay, who is building the 60,000 square foot barns to keep the hay and grain and the animals in when winter comes and lasts for 10 years, you know? I mean, where are those? Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think all of those things to me are interesting. And so I like to play with it. Cool. Excellent. And so uh, when you've been, uh, how, well, in looking at the, the economic and the cultural legal structures, um, 
did they actually can kind of become like a character in your own stories uh, about about these types of things so that it's a it's a background thing that's always there? Yeah, I try. Um, you know, just like with Tolkien, Middle Earth, the landscape was really a character yeah. in The Lord of the Rings. I've tried to make sure that law and politics and economics is sort of an always a background hum, um, even as people are, you know, all the all the Sturm and Drang and and uh, you know agony of the characters is going on unrequited love you know be, feeling disrespected but I always want this in the background that it's in the context of this of this world um, I mean I have this desperate desire I, I adore Star Wars it's um, I know this is probably heresy because I've worked on Star Trek but I actually prefer the Star Wars universe and I'm desperate to write a Star Wars novel because you know, I keep asking all these questions like, why is everybody cooking rat on a stick, you know, in a marketplace that looks like it's the 12th century when there are giant spaceships? I mean, you know, is there an Amazon? You know, are there traveling theater groups that say, oh, we're getting the newest play from Coruscant, you know, that are coming through. I mean, I, I want to know what the Minneapolis of Star Wars looks like, you know, because it seems like there's Coruscant and Tatooine and there's nothing in between and there has to be something in between. So, you know, I'm hoping someday when things are a little more normal, um, I'll get a chance to pitch my idea for a, for a Star Wars novel. We'll see if anybody bites, you know. Well, I certainly hope so, because I'd like to see somebody address some of those issues. And it's like, how do you have all these varied levels of technology around the universe and then mixing and mashing everything together? And no one notices that this is kind of weird, that we're still doing stuff Stone Age style over here, and we're in, uh, you know, starships over city. here. Yeah, I know, in a planet that's an entire city. And, okay, I mean, obviously, they're importing all their food from where, you know, I mean, I, yeah, I, I have questions. So and I, I think to, everybody does a bit if they yeah. stop to think about it at all. And I would love to write about it because it's kind of my jam, you know, to get into all that weird stuff. So uh, when you do your writing, are you normally a long form uh, writer or do you also do some short form? The only short stories I generally write are for Wild Cards, which is a shared world anthology series that I co-edit and co-created with George R. R. Martin. Um, we've been doing it for more years than I want to admit to, <laughs> because then you'll know how old I am. But we have, uh, we have 28 books in the pipeline. I think 26 of them are out currently. Um, we've been doing it for a long time, and um, that's the, really the only place. I'm terrified of short stories. I think they're much harder than novels, and so I am, I am a novel-length writer, except when I'm doing screenplays. I mean, I can, I can you know, do a one hour of television without any problem at all. And if I could somehow just convince myself that a short story is a lot like a screenplay, I would probably be okay, but uh, generally not. So that's really the only place. Um, and if you if people don't know what a shared world is, it's um, George and I created this sandbox, if you will. Excuse me, my nose itches because of this thing. Um, <laughs> All right, I'll, I'll talk um, a little bit to cover up for you for a second. You can go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> He's like, mm -hmm. um, anyway, George and I created the sandbox, uh, which is a world in which an alien virus has been released over Earth, creating superheroes, but also twisting and deforming people who contract this virus and killing a whole lot of them. And then after we created the universe, we went out to friends, other writers, and we said, uh, hey, you want to come and play in the sandbox? And, uh, you know, over the years, we've had, you know, lots of writers, you know, people get busy with their own work and drop out. And then we bring in new young, young blood, which have fresh <laughs> outlooks. On. And it is so much fun to see because we get to use each other's characters. We have to show the other writer, if they lose their character, we have to say, hey, is this okay? Yeah. But it's great to see how other people see your character um, because you get an, different insights into the character you created because somebody else sees them in a very different way. Yeah. So um, I just love it. It's the closest thing to being in a television writer's room that you can have in prose. It, it has similarities to what it's like in a, in a writer's room in Hollywood. Very cool. And to what degree do you change other people's characters or do you do it, try to do it episodically so they, they're put back the way they started at the end? 
No, no, our characters, um, that's one of the things George and I have insisted on is that events affect people and they continue to be, have impact. Um, and one other thing we've done, unlike the comics, if you're dead in wild cards, you're dead. <laughs> there is no retconning, there is no coming back because, you know, I've always felt like death should have a consequence. Um, and, and I get very upset with books or television shows or movies that ask me for an emotional response and then go, never mind, didn't matter. Um, you know, honor my emotional reaction. Um, I mean, I probably shouldn't say this because I'm in the business, but I mean, in, in um, uh, the, the Rise of Skywalker, the last Star Wars movie, I actually thought they'd killed Chewie. And I was like, oh my God, that's heartbreaking. But that's so enormously powerful. And it was like, nah, didn't happen. And C-3PO, if he had really lost all of his memories, that would have been powerful. But no, they put them all back. Um, and and that's, that's just, it's a cheat. I mean, and, and again, this is, I'm not saying that we shouldn't have happy endings. I'm a huge advocate of the happy ending. Um, I think that, you know, people read because we want to be uplifted and we want to say, could I meet this challenge? And you know, and so I have nothing, I, I have no, no problem with a happy ending, but I do want there to be consequences and for it to mean something, so. In, in a sense that people have to work for that happy ending and you have to uh, acknowledge what happened to get there. Yeah, and oftentimes to achieve the happy ending there, it has to be sacrifice. Um, and so it can't all just be, you know, flowers and roses and, and, and candy, you know, you've got to, you've got to have to work for it. So the journey doesn't mean much if at the end, all the people that that's quote unquote sacrificed are all brought back to life again at the end. Right, right exactly. Uh, tell me a little bit about your horses and you'd ride dressage. Yeah, I'm a dress, I'm an upper level, I'm an FEI dressage rider, um, which I know, come to my, come to my Facebook page because I do all these neeps about horseback riding <laughs> and you'll get, get to see some of what dressage is. Um, I have two horses, they're both Lusitanos. Um, those are Portuguese horses. They're bred, well, they initially were bred for war and bullfighting and they're still bred for bullfighting. So they're very brave and they're very quick and they're very smart. Um, but they're, they're great dressage horses as well. And so um, I'm having just a ton of fun. My older horse is, um, a, well, he's gray technically, but a pure white stallion named Vento da Broga. And then my younger horse is called Donador. He's a, he's a buckskin, um, but he just doesn't seem like a Donador because, you know, very noble, fabulous name. So we call him Noodles for short. Vinto has no nickname. Vinto would not tolerate it because he, he's like, I am a Spaniel, you know, I am a Latin stallion. You do not call me short city names. You yes. know, but he's aristocracy. He doesn't put up with that. He is, he doesn't put up with that. But uh, Donador is noodles and he seems to respond well. Um, and, you know, Vinto is a Grand Prix horse. He's shown the Grand Prix. Um, I'm getting ready to show. I've only ridden to Intermediaire 2, which is one step below the Grand Prix. It's really hard. <laughs> and uh, and Donador is coming along. You know, I think he's going to make it. He just, uh, when I got him, he didn't have a work ethic. So we had to teach him to have a work ethic. You know, one of the things with horses. So, yeah. Anyway, and it's kind of a guys. It's kind of a problem with any kind of animal uh, that you're trying to train if they're too smart is they, <laughs> they, they, uh, <laughs> they interject themselves into the training routine. Yeah, I mean, with Vinto, it's like he tries to take over. He's like, I know how to do this. Do not tell me how to do this. And with Donador, it's like, do I really have to do this? He's kind of like a teenage, he's like, sort of like having a 13 year old boy. No, you really have to clean your room. <laughs> you really, really do. Yeah, but, uh, <laughs> and Vinto's yeah. like, I know how to do it. I have got it all, you know? So they're fun. I, I love them dearly. And um, I, I'm at the barn. Today was one of my days off and, and uh, it is nice to have a day for, you know, where I don't have to go and saddle and ride two horses and you know, do all this stuff. So it is a lot of work. Absolutely. I mean, I know several people who are into horses uh, just down here in Tucson that you know, too. Yeah. Uh, Judy Tarr, uh, Beth Meekham and all these others. It's like, it's, yeah. 
it's insane the amount of work goes in, into it, but uh, everybody seems to love it. They, they'll grouse about it, get, getting themselves uh, uh, to, uh, every, up every day in order to do the work, but they'll, at the end, they're all happy. <laughs> well, I, I, I used to have the horses in my backyard. I did for 20 some years and um, I'm kind of over that. So I, board, I have them, they're, they're four miles away. Um, cause I'm just tired of getting up and cleaning stalls and feeding horses three times a day and riding them. And, you know, I was like, mm, no, <laughs> I think I'm gonna, I think I'm going to take a, take a breath from that. So, yeah. um, and when oh, I was and... in California working, um, you know, you really can't have a place with, you know, you, you have to put your horses at a big facility. At a, so, um, that's where I kind of really went, oh, this is nice. <laughs> I like not having to clean the stalls every day. So. You seem to have a lap weight there. Uh, introduce us. Yeah, this is, this is Kimchi, and he's, he's 19 years old, and he's such a good guy. A gorgeous um, cat. He, yeah, I mean, I wish you could have seen him in his prime. He was a big, burly guy, and now he's kind of just a rack of bones, but you know, he, he still seems to be enjoying life. And so as long as he's happy, we'll, you know, we'll, we'll go on. Um, but yeah, he's a good little guy. Uh, so yeah, I, I think when, when I lose him, then I've got to rethink, you know, am I, I'll probably get more cats. Um, I love dogs. I've had dogs and I have a big place. I have 10 acres here. So room for a dog to roam, but you know, once the pandemic gets under control, we maybe have a vaccine, please. Um, I'll be back having to travel a lot to conventions, comic conventions, science fiction conventions. And it's just much harder with dogs than it is with cats. You know, they're, it's easier to get house sitters. They're more self-reliant. And so, you know, that's, that's where it is. So. Absolutely. Well, it's, uh, I was just wondering if there's anything, oh, what's, what was the most recent book that you uh, are getting out at the moment? It's one of your reprints, I believe. Yeah, I'm, we're getting out uh, The Hidden World, which is the third book mm -hmm. in the Imperial Saga. It will be out in about two weeks. I think there's going to be a pre-sale for it um, yeah. in, in just uh, a little while. And I've got to give a shout out uh, first to my cover artist, who is... Hugo Award winners, her name is Elizabeth Leggett. Um, mm -hmm. And you should check out her work. She has this amazing, I mean, she's just a, an extraordinary artist. And I'm so, I'm so grateful to and honored to have her doing my covers. And they are, they are actually, I will show you one. There you go. Book. That's the ticket. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. this is uh, book one, um, The High Ground. Um, oh, that's and, gorgeous work. Yeah. And, and, you know, she just finished the cover for book three. Um, and, and unlike every other publisher or every other um, person, she got it. Um, by the time I get to book three, my characters are no longer in their 20s, they're in their mid 40s. And, and her cover reflects that. And I, you know, I just, instead of everything looking like it was frozen. I mean, the thing I did with Imperials, it was a little different is you meet my two main characters, they're 18 years old in book one. And by the time um, I finished the entire series, book five is done. By the end of the, the final uh, book, they're in their mid fifties. And so you see this, you know, arc of their lives. Um, and, and that was really fun to do. So I, you know, I wanted to, uh, I have a big universe though. So, so my, my publisher, Alexi Vandenberg of Prince of Cats Productions um, is saying, so what are you going to write about next in the Imperials universe? And I'm like, well, let's see. Is it going to be the next generation? Is it going to be the kids? Is it, you know, where, where am I going to go? Um, yeah. And I haven't quite decided yet because I have this other series. I'm trying to finish a fourth and final book in. And I have, here's the other, this is the White Fang. This is book one of the White Fang um, Law series. Mm -hmm. Very and good. And I'm actually starting to outline the fourth and final book in that series. Um, I'm doing a little bit of research on, on what legal problems can arise with an equestrian facility. <laughs> um, so uh, I, I'm an outliner. I'm not a pantser or a gardener, as George calls it. I outline everything um, as if it's a screenplay, which is a skill I learned in Hollywood. So yeah. 
Um, yeah. yeah, and that's so, and that's a that's a different skill sc screenwriting from uh, being a novelist too. Yeah, and honestly, I was born to be a screenwriter <laughs> because I love dialogue and I hate description. I have to force myself to furnish the room, and you know, and don't look to my books for you know the waving fields of grain and long lyrical descriptions of of landscapes. Um, I, I like to put people into a situation and have them interact with each other. So that, that's sort of where I, where I am um, in terms of what I, what I love to read and what I like to write. So, um, and obviously I can't outline a novel the same way I would outline a screenplay because a novel is much longer, but I do the same form of, I do a teaser in three acts normally for a novel um, as opposed to a screenplay, which would be a teaser in four or five acts. And I put in every scene for the screenplay and I put in the most important scenes for the, for the novel. Um, Cause I know the sort of linking scenes will fill themselves in if I know what the big, the big tentpole moments are, I'll be good. So. Exactly, yeah. Yep, all right, very cool. I was wondering, do you, do you find any crossover between your gaming and your writing or do you deliberately keep them separate? Oh my God, no. <laughs> um, the lead character in my Carolingian series, which I don't have anything to show you from that one yet because we're just starting to get it back out. Um, the lead character was the character I played in the game. <laughs> and uh, and uh, there was a game you ran um, that uh, <laughs> I created a character for it. Yes. And oh my God, he was such a mess <laughs> and so much fun to play. And I suddenly realized he was the key to a book I've been struggling to get my arms around. So he's gonna end up, you know, with some variations, but he will end up in this book um, that I'll probably try outlining, you know, in a few months. Um, and, um, and actually the hero of Imperials, the young character Thracius, Tracy Bell Manor, is, um, is also a character um, that comes out of a game that I, I created for games. So, you know, I always tell parents, you know, stop yelling at your kids about not wasting their time with that silly gaming, because I have actually found it to be enormously useful and inspiring. So, you know, I, I, I think, and in fact, uh, the character I'm playing in the current game you and I are in, um, he's actually in Imperials. <laughs> I just took him out of Imperials. <laughs> you just transplanted him over. I like that. I just that. transplanted him in the other direction. He went from, he went from the Imperials <laughs> books into this game, uh, my, my, my Catholic, my Jesuit priest. Uh, <laughs> so um, yeah, I mean, I just find that there's, it, because it inspires your imagination and uh, it, it, you know, you really get into it. I mean, I play video games too. <laughs> I, um, so yeah, <laughs> I do Sp all that. Speaking of which, I, I made it through the original part of Dragon Age or, uh, Origins the first time, and now I'm in the Awakenings after uh, Oh, right, after yeah, game. yeah, which is fun, where you get your own castle and stuff, yeah. Yeah, it's like, oh, okay, this is kind of cool. So, but yeah. there's, some, there's some bizarrenesses in it, but I'm just getting used to it. Yeah, well, and, uh, let me give you a tip. <laughs> um, I would skip the second game, uh, Dragon Age 2. It's, it was supposed to be a DLC, a downloaded content. Yeah. And they quickly tried to turn it into a full game and it's really kind of a mess. Um, but the third game, uh, Inquisition, is mm. terrific. I played yeah. it all the way through twice. And Dragon Age Origins, I think I've played through four or five times all the way through. And every time I find some new little thing I missed before. Oh yeah, it's it's amazing how complex it is and how a lot of the, your decisions affect uh, other other events down the, down the pipe. Yeah, a friend of mine, um, actually Daniel Abraham's wife decided to play Origins on one game run through as just a complete jerk, you know, just a real, you know, terrible human being. And when she got to the final battle, she only had two companions left with her because all the others had walked out on her. They were just like, nope, you are a dreadful person and we're out of here. And I love that to have consequences, you know, again, you make these choices. Uh, did you manage to save the kid at, um, at Red uh, of the... Oh, yes, absolutely. I, that's one of the things I, I, because I, I went through and I played very, very carefully as the most noble of human being I could be. And I, I picked a lot of times the harder thing to yeah. do 
uh, but it was the nice thing to do. And yeah, I saved the kid and everything. And saved mom and, you know, didn't have to sacrifice anybody. And didn't yeah. even, didn't even kill the, the, uh, the, the mage that poisoned, poisoned them uh, either. The Arl. No, I didn't either. I play this, I play as this very noble. I always play an elf. That was one of the other reasons I hated the ah. second game. They made, they, you had no choice. You had to be a human. And, and as a writer, that game made me nuts because the entire first act is designed. The whole question is getting mommy a house. And I was like, really? I know. This is my problem. Well, I, have to I, I, started, I started with uh, Dragon Age 2 and played through that several times. And then, oh, I got, okay. then I got Origins and Inquisition and I'm going through Origins now. And yeah, so, no, yeah. I, Dragon Age 2 is like, what happened? Well, they got rushed. I mean, it's sort of like the end of Mass Effect 3. It's like, guys, oh my God, guys, I put in 150 hours into that game. I love that game. I wrote, I was so outraged at the ending of the third game that I wrote a 140 page fanfic <laughs> from, that ended it for my shepherd because you I- You fixed it. You fixed I it. I fixed it, you know, because I was like, okay, this just, you know, Rules of writing 101, do not bring in a new villain in the last 15 minutes. Do not, and do not make every effort you've made pointless. Oh, know? meaningless, absolutely. And that, that, is, that is scary. That goes into the whole thing about uh, anybody who's just writing anything uh, where they throw in some sort of deo ex machina at the end and makes it so that all the struggle up to then is just wiped out. It's like, oh, okay. you know. yeah. <laughs> Oh, you went to, you, you created this giant fleet. You brought peace to all these warring groups and none of it matters. Pick a color. And I was like, are you kidding me? You know, it's so sad. I, yeah, I, I, I haven't been able, and, and that's actually an argument I've had with George. I mean, he keeps saying, you know, the journey is everything. And I keep saying, no, if you don't stick the landing, I don't care how mm -hmm. great the journey was. I have not been able to bring myself to go back and replay the earlier Mass Effect games, because I know that terrible ending is waiting out there. Yeah. And so, and, and if I do play, I always stop 15 minutes before the end and just go, nope, I'll go read my fanfic again <laughs> about how it yes. actually ended. Well, also too, and I've, I've heard that in good writing, uh, the ending should always echo the opening. And yeah. so therefore, if the two don't match, if they're not bookends to each other, that makes sense, um, it, it's, the whole story is not worth it. I, I'm going to go back to one of my favorite books. You know, instead of talking about, well, my book, I do this. But if you look at Lord of the Rings, the battle for the Shire at the end of the third book is the point of the entire book, the entire series, the scouring of the Shire. And when I was, I, I got those books when I was 10 years old. So at first I was like, well, why is all this boring stuff here after Aragorn becomes king? Because I was a kid. And then when I reread them, I've reread them probably seven or eight times, um, the trilogy. And in my forties, I sat down and read the book. And this was, and I suddenly went, oh my God, the scouring of the Shire is everything. Yeah. It is what he was going for from the opening moments. And, and, you know, yes, it's written in a very 19th century style. It's sort of, you know, distant third person yeah. all the way through. You don't get into anybody's head really, but it's such a beautiful series. And, and that ending, and I've always thought it was a shame. I mean, I understand the Hollywood side of me knows why they left out the scouring of the Shire out of the movies, but I think it was, tragedy that it was because I think it undercut everything he was actually trying to talk about. Yeah. About well, the whole scouring of the Shire for me was everything else and the rest of the, of the story in microcosm right there, you saw yeah. it all and how you it affected the common people, not just the nobles. Had a stake in this mm -hmm. and that even though they won, there was loss and yes. nothing was ever going the elves were going in the bigger world, the elves were going into the West. Mm -hmm. And in the small world, it was damage was done. You know, yeah. it wasn't coming back the way it was. Yeah, which it'd never be exactly the same. It would be better. It got somewhat repaired, but it was never going to be exactly the same. It was never going to be exactly that, you know, bucolic, 
wonderful, peaceful world it had been at the beginning. And, and yeah, uh, kind of a metaphor for America right now. You know? Yeah. <laughs> but, Although yeah. I think that I do, I do quibble with, with Tolkien on one thing about that is he had, um, uh, King uh, Aragorn actually go ahead, Elisar, go ahead and actually wall off the Shire from all other, or from all humans, so that they, humans couldn't go in. And Did that, that? I, was that yeah. in the appendices that I missed? <laughs> yeah, no, that was in, that was at the end. He, uh, he, he declared that uh, no, uh, no uh, humans were going to be allowed across the bridge, the Brandywine Bridge. Huh, I've got to go, I, now I've got to go back and reread the, the trilogy yeah. again. <laughs> and, I, and I thought that was a little bit of a, of a you know, uh, isolationist kind of idea. And it actually, they probably should have had to learn to deal with the change and the age of man uh, coming in right. and their place yeah. in it. Well, the elves just went, yeah, age of man, we're out of here. <laughs> you know? Exit stage <laughs> left. <laughs> Yeah, and, and on the other hand, you know, given how humans are, I mean, that's sort of what I wrote about in Imperials. I wanted to explore the fact that humans, you know, my whole premise of this was what if we're the evil invading aliens and not the other way around? And maybe that's what uh, King Elisar was thinking was, you know, maybe, maybe we ought to really leave the hobbits alone because we're kind of crappy, you know? <laughs> human being yeah here, so. we're, we're, we try to take advantage of everything we get our hands on we get our hands on yeah exactly yeah. just so. ask any africans or any native americans right and yeah. and uh, our our environment i mean the planet's going help me <laughs> you know and, and we're we're being foolish but anyway yeah. exactly so anyway i was just wondering if there's anything else you want to bring up and at the end uh to let us know about what's going on in your life yeah, no, I just, um, I, you know, I really, really, really hope we get a vaccine so that Tuscon, which is one of my favorite conventions ever, can Thank you. Back and not be a virtual convention. Um, you know, I'm really looking forward to actually getting to hang out with, with other folks who love our genre as much as I do. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's been hard, but at least we have, you know, brilliant scientists who created this technology that allows us to at least stay in touch a little bit. So now I'll just keep writing and writing <laughs> and, uh, and uh, you know, we'll, we'll hang in there and then hopefully we'll all gather together again and have a great time next year. So definitely crossed. looking Definitely looking forward to it. I want to thank you so much for sitting down for this interview with me. This was great. Well, thank you for inviting me. I really appreciate it. So, okay. Well, thank you so much. And again, I hope to see you at Tuscon next year. <laughs> yes. Kimchi says bye. Bye, bye Kimchi. <laughs> bye, bye. Thanks again. <laughs> thank you. <laughs>